please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks to the board for showing up tonight. And everyone out there, I started early, I'm sorry Sarah. It's so beautiful out there, I'll try and keep this moving along. Um, just a couple comments, I wanted to uh, thank the RSU1 community uh, for supporting the budget referendum. Um, the final vote was uh, 560 in favor and 130 against, and that was the, the second part of the validation that was at the ballot box. Um, I just, again, appreciate the, the support and trust of the community, but I also want to remind folks that going forward, we really need to be diligent about getting the public involved in both parts of the process because um, it doesn't take much to sway this budget one way or the other, so it's important that the public um, you know, be involved, participate, education for most, if not all, of our communities is the biggest budget item, line item, so be mindful of that. Uh, we will move on to item 4.0. Uh, we have three sets of minutes to approve and or amend. We'll begin with the minutes from May 22nd. Is there a motion regarding these minutes? Acceptance. Move to accept by Alan. Second. Second by Bill. Any comments, questions? Okay. Just take a minute. All those in favor of the motion to accept, please raise your hand. Okay, none opposed? Passes. Uh, next, the minutes from May 30th, 2017, and that was the uh, first part of the, the public meeting for the budget. Is there a motion regarding those minutes? We will move to approve by Bill. Second by Steve. Any changes, amendments on those? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to approve, raise your hand. Okay, that passes. Okay, on to the minutes from June 13th. Uh, and I'm quite sure Vita was not present for these. Um, I'm thinking Patrick took the minutes on these. Um, so they may not be as thorough as we're used to. Uh, and I can say I can say that even with Patrick not here. So is there a motion regarding these minutes? Move to approve by Steve. <laughs> Second by Bill. I'm pretty sure I was at that meeting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we would move you from absent yeah. to present. <laughs> um, any other changes to the minutes? I wanted to ask Jen on page two. Uh, under the cooperative agreement concerning the Sheepskin Regional Education Program for children with exceptionalities, you had made some comments about that. Did you want those included, or are you fine without them? Good with that? I, I trust you. Okay. All right. 
so the motion on the floor is to approve the minutes uh, with one adjustment moving Megan from absent to present. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Any opposed? None opposed? And pass this. Next item, uh, adjustments to the agenda. Judy, anything? Okay. Um, I just wanted to add item 8.4, just wanted to make a comment on the Bath Japan Exchange Program. Suburu Exchange Program. Cool. <clears throat> All right, item 6.0, public session. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to an item that's on the agenda? If so, welcome. Okay. Uh, we will move on to uh, item 7.0, staff reports. And we have two staff reports. We'll begin with a technology update from Bob Jordan.
um, for some teachers, it's just a matter of consultation. Uh, and for some, it's a quick introduction. And some want some ongoing support, depending on um, what, the, what the topic is. Classroom systems. And these are the things that help classrooms operate well, and uh, there's some efficiency to be gained here. I'm going to spend a bit of time with Google Classroom because the model for that kind of fits with the way I introduce other topics as well. Google Classroom is a classroom management system. It's a way that teachers can post assignments, post announcements uh, to the students, and uh, can collect digital work from them as well. If we're asking students to make, you know, uh, to make, to do, complete their work in Google Docs, we need a way to collect it as well. There's also a great opportunity for dialogue with students as well. What are the specific things about the assignment that a student could improve in order to, to do it better? Okay. So uh, again, I provide, uh, I help for many teachers, it's just helping with one or two things. I have a classroom introduction that I'm going to show you because it, I think, is a model for how I do, do others. Uh, providing ongoing support helps as well. And, uh, and then oftentimes teachers come back. It's a pretty rich tool. And uh, <coughs> after an introduction, um, teachers can benefit from seeing more. So this is uh, a look at the uh, introductory activity that I would do in Google Classroom. Okay, so you can see right now we have multiple types of devices in the district. So some instruction about how this might use work for iPad users and for computer users. Uh, this is the kind of obstacle that teachers might bump into. So how do I get students signed up? This, uh, this is a canned presentation that can help uh, teachers get through that quickly. And here, immediately having students uh, use the question asking um, uh, feature of Google, of Google Classroom. Uh, this is a good icebreaking sort of activity, and students respond to a question, and uh, teachers can immediately use that in the classroom to, uh, to enrich their instruction. Okay? Um, often have students immediately submit an assignment, post a quick assignment, have students do the work and submit it, so immediately they're seeing the dynamic of how the product uh, works in the classroom. This helps teachers and students. So I had a, this involved an activity uh, it, where students had to go to a website that involves uh, children from around the world uh, putting their favorite toys in front of them. Students would pick a toy using the iPad, they would mark it up, and then the follow-up example, of the, or the additional exam, uh, part of the assignment uh, was creating a Google document where they reflected on you know, what they saw. Here's an example with another picture. You can see that the student's name took out the, the real student's name. Right up here, you can see the markup. And so a student, within 20 minutes, uh, would introduce this. The students would have uh, entered an assignment and something could be graded and used. So that's kind of the basic model that I use for, um, uh, for uh, in instructing in lots of applications. Another way teachers can um, help facilitate communication with uh, teacher, with students and parents and others in the community is by setting up websites. I've got several examples here. I'm going to share this website with all of you later on. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go through many of these things quickly, but you can explore these and feel free to ask questions later. Uh, but I'll show you that this is the Morris Physical Education website. Okay, uh, homepage here designed for spring, and then one of the menu options includes all units. Okay, that go with this. Okay, among them say Ultimate Frisbee, and you can see with this they could embed videos, and then down below here is the unit sheet that goes uh, with this assignment. Students, the, the phys ed department has this set up. Once this is set up for the whole year, really most of their curriculum is set up and, and ready to go. Okay, there's a couple, a couple other examples from BMS and one of the houses at the, at the middle school as well. So if all this is doing well, there's effective and timely communication with students and parents. We'll probably use less paper, less things coming through email. Uh, materials are always available. Somebody asks for what the homework assignment is, they go to the website. Um, and students are more and more familiar with Google Classroom. They're sometimes asking their teachers for Google Classroom or something like it to provide uh, materials in a convenient way. Uh, application support. Again, there's lots of examples here, and I'm just going to show you a few. Uh, in the academy, part of the academy program is doing lots of activities and then making presentations uh, to uh, a larger audience at the, at the end of the unit. The first one involved interviewing uh, veterans. 
And now when you're doing the interview process, you want to make sure your recording device works. These are the sorts of obstacles that often get in the way of teachers doing things. Can I get that recording device to work? Will the students be able to upload that material? Will they be able to use it? Or is it going to get lost in just the confusion of technology? Here, I, was, uh, I helped that happen. There's a sample of the uh, veteran interview there, and oftentimes they were making you know, presentations uh, at, at the end. The winter one involved uh, using a specific application, uh, Adobe Spark, that's really useful in, in, in lots of settings. And then uh, in the spring, um, we set all these up on a website. And this is the, the website that includes all of the uh, uh, academy presentations. This was designed so that students could go one after another without sort of fumbling and connecting from one to the next. Most of these are set up in Google Slides, and you just have a set of presentations right here. The students did presentations with the, uh, um, uh, with the slides presentations. Um, oftentimes, using video is a powerful tool in the classroom. This can often be difficult. How do I get the videos off the camera to formatting sorts of issues? And there's an example here that I put together for an introductory activity uh, that we did at, uh, you know, at uh, in Woolwich. Um, and I did a video alongside of it that went by a riff. You can see lots of hyperlinks in the activity I have there. That's designed to provide the materials that students need to um, do things effectively. Uh, 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 sort of a garden variety uh, slideshow being done here. This one was done for Mr. O'Leary. Uh, he had students do presentations related to the, to the book night. And uh, again, this kind of focused on this, uh, as I work with Mr. O'Leary, I'm focusing on the specific things that he wants to see in that presentation um, to, uh, um, so that he can, so that students come up with good results. Maybe I can highlight that here a little bit at the end. He wanted to have relatively few words but powerful images. And I had an example in here kind of with work is liberty, with two images, and kind of same words, different picture. You get a, a completely different sort of view on that, uh, on that assignment. Um, here's an example of using a new application. Uh, Maria Morris, the JMG teacher, has an activity that involves uh, career research. And in the past, she had done sort of a straightforward slideshow. She wanted to do sort of an infographic instead, okay, but wasn't quite sure where to go. I took a look and found an application online that worked well on that, worked with her product descriptor, and came up uh, uh, with this picture chart that was a free application, worked well with students on multiple platforms, and came up with things like this. And if you looked at this closely along with her, her description, you know, that mirrors what's going on. I put in a couple others for a guidance counselor and a canine um, officer, and along the way I provide her uh, support materials, and I did a sample since this was the first time they had done this, uh, done this activity. Okay. Um, additionally, uh, the, you know, part of my uh, job is finding uh, applications that work well in the classroom more quickly without too much training. Don't be smart and fit for that. The Hood is an online quiz activity that's relatively easy for most teachers to use. Uh, some teachers appreciate having somebody in the classroom the first time that they do it. Uh, Plotly is a powerful online graphing application. Turns out that using numbers on an iPad um, doesn't work very well for this one specific activity a teacher was doing, and uh, uh, Google Sheets wasn't quite up to the task. So how do we do this? That's a time sink for a teacher. Um, I can provide that, that service. And then uh, Google Sites is what, your, what this presentation is being is coming up with you right now, uh, and the ability to present and then to share with you uh, later on as part of that. All this kind of came together in uh, a final project that, that the AP history classes did. They read a book at the end of the semester and did a trailer, uh, did trailers for them, and created QR codes that go on books in the library. So if you had your cell phone, you could read that QR code and the book trailer will come up. Uh, there's videos that go with this, and I invite you to take a look at that later on. They had sort of an Academy Awards type of presentation that they went with this in the library. Um, along the way, there's also um, uh, some coaching that goes about you know, proper use, not using you know, copyrighted material, using stuff that's, that's free access. Um, okay. So, 
uh, administrative support. Just a couple of examples here. Uh, one responsibility that teachers have is provide student support for IEP special education meetings. This was traditionally done by putting a pink sheet in students' mailbox, in, in uh, teachers' mailboxes, and they would get to it, but sometimes it would get a little bit misplaced and maybe didn't come back in a timely manner. Setting up a Google form to do this. Uh, they're getting a much better response rate, much more convenient for teachers, and the special ed department is getting much better, more timely information. Um, similarly, at BMS, uh, a lot of email is coming with uh, uh, sort of notifications of when students were being dismissed and, and announcements. Uh, if you put that in a in an in a accessible place, um, that can uh, unclutter people's email boxes and make them more efficient. Finally, uh, some PBL support. Uh, I've been working with the with Morse about uh, you know, applying, uh, applying the guiding principles, the standards-based guiding principles, and that's going to be done with the ninth graders next year. And this website is really a toolkit that puts together sort of all the aspects of here. So you can see I've embedded a Google document here uh, and created an assignment for each indicator and each indicator has a rubric that goes with it itself. This is an additional responsibility for teachers, but really we had to set up the tech part of it set to go um, so that it has a good chance of being uh, applied fairly well. Uh, now, this website uh, also shows how um, to create a portfolio. Students will create a portfolio of their work documenting this, and uh, all the record keeping will go with, uh, with Google Classroom. This is what Google Classroom looks like. You can see what's done, what's not done. All the assignments are, are posted and, uh, and ready to go. Okay, so finally, uh, it seems to me that RSU1 has demonstrated a commitment to support learning with technology. You've made an investment in Chromebooks. This is a new platform that's going to require some new skills. People have been using Pages and Apple type documents are going to need to do things a little bit differently. And there's a networking sharing effect that's really going to benefit the district if folks can get those basic skills down. Um, you've uh, provided uh, appropriate professional development is an important part of this. Uh, and it needs, to, as I said before, to be focused on individual needs and skill levels. Helping those who need help and helping those who have a lot of expertise uh, do even more with it. Uh, there is a matter of providing time for this. Okay, uh, this is if it's your, this is over and above everything else. Uh, this is going to be difficult to implement. Uh, I think the tech department is in a good position to help the Chromebook to, to help us do this well. Uh, you have an excellent staff in place to make sure that the devices are, are serviced and maintained and running well. And then my role is to help teachers. Uh, have the skills that they need, and students have the skills that they need to use these tools in the classroom. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Thank you, Bob. Did anyone from the board have questions? Jen? So, Bob, uh, what do you think as you've come to know the teachers? classrooms. Do you think that there is a common, like Bob Mazzano says, it's really important about building background language when it comes to teaching in the classroom. Do you feel that our staff have an opportunity to build their background knowledge so there is a kind of a level understanding that each teacher comes in with the ability to use technology well or understand the vocabulary of the technology that we have? Well, I think we have an excellent opportunity to do that with the move to Chromebooks. Chromebooks are a Google product and it sort of plays well with Google Classroom, Gmail. And we've started using a lot of those products, so there's a pretty good base understanding of how Google Classroom works, how Gmail works, uh, Google Drive, but there's work to be done there. And as a tech department, we've talked quite a lot about it. We have to make sure that we have that firm foundation. Okay, so a real effort, and, and now is the time to do that. We have a fair number of people, and uh, several years ago, the district was saying you really should be making things in pages. You should be making them in, in another platform that doesn't work so well with Google Drive. Now things are fairly well standardized, and so I think there's both, we bring resources to provide the training for that, and 
you know, now is the time to, to make the leap into, into those products. So, um, kind of coming from two sides, I, I think we're, we're headed there. Thank you. Any other questions? Steve? I just have a couple. Just in terms of proportion, how much, how, you know, roughly, how much time do you think you spend on teachers versus kids? Uh, teachers, well, usually when there's a fair amount of sort of one-on-one -on -one consultation with teachers, and sometimes those are quick, sort of one-off types of things. So, uh, oftentimes, I mean, I'm doing my job, but I have a short interaction as opposed to, to a long interaction. So, uh, and mostly when I'm working with students, I'm working with students at the invitation of the teacher. I'm supporting a specific activity that's going on in the classroom. And so, as I mentioned, for some teachers, um, they just want the consultation. Some teachers maybe want the introduction, and for others, particularly like some of the video types of activities, uh, teachers don't want there to be an obstacle you know, to completion of the assignment. So if they're sensing that students might have trouble uh, you know, translating and uploading the video and making it available, um, then they'd invite me into their classroom sort of as a, as a follow-up. Um, so, um, so I guess you know, more time with teachers, oftentimes teachers with students in the classroom. And then I spend a fair amount of time sort of working through things uh, you know, to, to put them together so that they're available for teachers. Um, the types of things that I used to do on my Sunday afternoon, figuring out how something works, because it needs to work for me in the classroom. You know, I spend my time you know, doing that for teachers, and hopefully um, you know, a 15 minute explanation for me, um, something I'm already familiar with, you know, I'll help save some time. Uh, that they, so they can focus on uh, providing the best instruction they can to their students. Um, how do you set your priorities? I mean, how do you, you, you gave us a, your plate is very full, let's put it down. So, um, just curious, how do you organize? Yeah, it's different. I, I think if, uh, the highest priority would be I have a teacher who's doing an activity and they need support on that tomorrow, okay? Um, some of my ability to deliver that is dependent upon teachers asking me in a timely way. It depends upon what the, you know, what the item is. Um, if, it's, if it was something like Adobe Spark, I mean, I had a canned presentation ready to go, I can tweak that a little bit for a specific classroom situation. I can respond to that pretty quickly. So typically what I do is, you know, if a teacher wants my time and they give me a little bit of lead time, I can usually book that time in my calendar and it'll you know, be available be available for them. Um, okay. and, and just one last comment. I'm going to take a little bit out because your 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 focus is is on high school. Is is on the uh, High school, but also the middle school. Uh, the middle school. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, just you know, this is a new position for the district. Um, I, I'm not. I'm speaking for myself. I'm very pleased we were able to do it. I'm, I'm convinced that it's that it was the right right thing to do and I'm convinced that we're going to get a great return um, on the type of, uh, the type of assistance you're going to provide. Do you think, and, and this is your opinion, do you think that this is something that we might look at in the future of building uh, the resource for the elementary uh, schools and, and more concentrate or some shared concentration on, on, on the middle schools as well? Uh, I think so. I, I mean, one of the things asking the elementary principals and so yeah, too. Uh, I think that uh, I think I expressed a little bit. One of my frustrations is a little bit that uh, a teachers teachers' days are full. Okay, pretty much. Right, I mean, at the preparatory, they have you know, multiple things that they're doing outside of their classroom responsibilities, and so some of the challenge can be for me can be you know finding the time to interact. And I think that works best when somebody like me is really embedded in it. You know, in a school, and oftentimes maybe even you know part of the instruction in the classroom. Okay, things and needs come up that maybe a teacher you know, doesn't you know maybe isn't thinking about, or isn't, or they're thinking, oh, I've got this, I can solve this myself. Uh, but when you're in sort of you know, swimming in the stream with the other fish kind of thing, you you are in a position where things are more likely to come up. And so being in multiple buildings, you know, that's been a little bit. That, that's difficult. It's difficult to sort of well, solve every day. Maybe, maybe it's another view somewhere else. Oh, you know, absolutely. I think like most of the resources in the tech department, there's an element of you, you, you know, before you spend money, you see how it's being utilized. And something's, we do the same thing with applications. 
okay, if we were going to use, you know, buy a you know, video product for Chromebooks, you know, how many people are using it? You buy it for everybody, you know, all at once and have it used by 50 people, and you know, buy it for 50 people and see how it's used. If it's getting used, full use, and then you move on to the next one. Um, I think some of the basic types of skills that we were talking about earlier, that kind of thing can be delivered sort of across, uh, across buildings and disciplines. Uh, but you know, some of the needs at the, at the high school versus the elementary level, those things are a little bit different. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from the board? I'd a comment for you. Okay. Um, sort of one to build on what Steve was saying, now you've done this for a year, it's new for the district. Um, first of all, what's what surprised you that you didn't expect going into this position? And then the second part of that is what goals and challenges do you see in the future? Yeah. I think finding time to work with my peers, that was more difficult than I than I anticipated. Um, uh, sort of creating the opportunities where that was going to happen. You know, so I think that there, you know, it is sort of an element of time and open. And they, when teachers are fully committed, you know, asking me to help them or to do something different, okay, to do something that they haven't done before in their classroom, that's and that's, that's taking a little bit of a risk, right? You, you know, I, I, from a teacher's perspective, tomorrow I've got you know 20 odd students coming into my classroom. What I'm doing needs to work. Now, even asking somebody else to help and consult with them on that, okay, now I've got another moving part, okay? I've got to explain my problem to them. They need to respond to that. Maybe they're going to come into my classroom. I had something last year that worked pretty well, and i got another group coming tomorrow. I'm going to, I'm going to go with that, okay, is kind of the idea. I mean, that's how I looked at the world when I was a teacher as well, and I can understand that and empathize with that quite a lot, uh, but I guess, you know, for me, that sort of understanding that, uh, that technology is the focus of my day-to-day -day work now. But for teachers, it's, it's something that's important, but it's kind of down the list a little bit, okay? If you've got things to respond to, you maybe don't get quite down that far. So I had some uh, interactions with teachers where, you know, they asked me for something and, you're do and you know, I was working on it a little bit. And then it's a little, I mean, I'm, I'm more of a, it, I've had jobs that have involved marketing a little bit, and I'm putting things out there, and I'm waiting for the phone to ring back the other way. And the phone isn't ringing back the other way because they've got 20 other things to do, um, you know, mine is first and foremost. So I think that, that's kind of the, you know, the real challenge. How do we find the time? How do we find, uh, maybe create the interactions, you know, where people are willing to sort of take, take those risks and, and uh, you know, be willing to, to work with me and do something new. So what are your goals going into next year and the year after? I think the other just building upon what you've started, just continuing that one-on-one -on -one interaction with staff and but, sort of addressing needs as they come up? Or well, is there I, something well I think there are also groups, as I look at uh, you know, the, the, the coming year, the, the proficiency-based, you know, the guiding principles thing, that's going to take some real focus and effort. Okay? We put some of the uh, pieces in place for students, uh, for teachers to be able to execute that, but in order for that to happen, there needs to be sort of some follow-up. Are you doing, you know, what we hoped you were doing? Uh, things can oftentimes, you know, the world is full of uh, uh, examples of, uh, of materials that are sitting on people's hard drives where they go into a training session, they set up their Google Classroom or whatever it was, and then they were just too busy to, to keep it going. Okay? So something like the guiding principles, it's only going to work if people have time to execute the work involved and they take advantage of the support in terms of technology that, that I can provide for doing that. So I'm kind of looking for groups. I had a discussion about the classroom specifically with ninth grade teachers uh, towards the end of the school year. They were interested in you know, how can we make sure that students have um, uh, keep track of work that students need to do. Well, it turns out that Google Classroom automatically, when an assignment is created, it puts it in the Google Calendar. People aren't really using that right now, but they're thinking about that. Would that be a solution for us? Okay, would that if everybody, maybe even if they don't quite want to, was to, was to use that process? Okay, then that might address one of our needs. Now that's for them to decide in terms of what's most effective. Okay, but that's sort of a group training that I did so that if people are making a judgment about Google Classroom, they're doing it with the basic of knowledge of how it works. Okay. Any other questions? Well, a comment. Um, uh, when we adopted a new mathematics program, um, 
and we did in this district, and we didn't um, require uh, every teacher to use every component. We had a very different outcome across the system because teachers were using segments that they wanted to use. So I guess the comment would be is that at some point, is there a expectation versus an option that if, you know, not because everybody has their own teaching style and needs to be able to do that, but if it was some basic expectation, would that help us decide at the end of a year was something successful or not because we would have statistically enough people doing it? Is there, I mean, it's just more of a comment or an observation in terms of extra planning? Yeah. Um I mean, th those are decisions, I think, for administrators to make, and, and maybe for faculty to be involved in that as well, Absolutely. right? You know, wh what are the things that we're committed to? And if we're committed to some things, then what you need to do is use that. Like if Google Calendar, just for example, was to be the calendar that people are going to use, then if something's put on Google Calendar, which you assume that everybody knows that, okay, and you're asking people to do something, that's a, you know, a commitment of, and the administrators and everybody to, to use that system and not to provide it also in the mailbox and in their email in you know, 12 different ways. Right? So if, if um, uh, those sorts of standards are set sort of thoughtfully and collaboratively, then they have a good chance of success and then you, you, you can't sort of bend on them. I mean, it's sort of like creating expectations in a classroom as well. Okay, if they're set up, but I think, you know, be, you, you know, be careful how many of those things you're setting up and is it, you know, is it serving a, a clearly defined purpose and are people gaining from it. Um, I think the, a lot of the Google products, I mean, Google Classroom, for example, uh, you know, students, I, I've noticed just in the last year, when you sign students up in for Google Classroom, they know what they're do doing. I mean, the, the students know there in two seconds, I have kids, you know, submitting the assignment, uh, you know, and when I'm halfway through the, the explanation, okay, that's when you start to get the effects. And then, you know, with some of those things, it starts to uh, become an expectation. I think we've gotten there, for example, with Gmail, right? I mean, you know, staff is expected to be able to, to read Gmail. There's something set to you, sent to you, to a your RSU1 account. Um, you, you're accountable for that, right? Okay. Well, thanks again. Great. Enjoy your summer. I hope you don't miss the classroom too much. <laughs> Item is uh, 7.2, um, presentation from the board goals on RTI grades K through 5. I'll turn this over to Judy. So, is it Jen and Sandra? Oh, it's all of you? Okay. So, the principals have been uh, working on this RTI process pretty much for the entire year. And maybe even a little bit last year. So uh, this is their, the results and, and something that they're planning to move ahead with next year. which includes a screening component, a progress monitoring component, 
and then different ways that we can offer those interventions to students, so that multi-level pre prevention system. RTI, or Response to Intervention, is a three-tiered system of assessment and instruction targeted for early identification of students with learning behavior needs. We're looking at screening students in literacy, math, and now in behavior as well, so that we can find their weak areas early on and address them and provide interventions to bring them up to the level that they should be at so that they can achieve in the classroom. Um, it starts with high quality instruction and that universal screening, so we're looking at all kids and checking out how they are doing in the classrooms. The screening process that we have in place for literacy in kindergarten includes the CAP, which is the concepts about print, uh, letter and sound ID, the Fountas and Pinnell word list. In your booklets, it talks about the DRA. We've made a, a switch just recently to a different um, literacy assessment called benchmark assessment. That is an assessment through Fountas and Pinnell that has um, what we believe are better results. It really digs into comprehension a little bit more, so we're really excited to be taking that on as our new literacy assessment in elementary school, and the Lucy Cockins program's writing prompts. We continue with many of those in first and second grade. Um, the word list for spellings change a little bit, and we start to do the computerized testing at the end of EBA as well. And then third through fifth grade, you can see those continue. For the math piece, in kindergarten, we do the everyday math pre and post tests as they go through their units. First and second grade, the same, but we do start using the NWBA, and that continues in third through fifth. So that screening process has been in place for a little bit. The piece that was not in place was a behavior screener, and so we've worked on that this year. When we do those assessments for literacy, we're looking at things like alphabetic knowledge, phonetic and phonemic skills, sight word development, reading accuracy and fluency, comprehension, writing mechanics, composition, and basic book handling skills. In math, we're looking at number ID and shape ID, comparative skills, like being able to say if things are less than or greater than, bigger and smaller, math number sent, sense, content knowledge, accuracy, and fact fluency. When you look at an RTI model or an intervention model, you see a three-tiered system, and as you move up the tiers, the intensity and the frequency of the intervention increases, and the size of the instructional group decreases. So essentially, as students need more and more support, you pull them in smaller and smaller groups and deliver additional instruction more frequently and with more um, intensity to them. All students receive that bottom tier of instruction, that primary level, that's the universal instruction. Um, and then as students show that they need additional support, they move into a secondary level. And if that does not appear to be meeting their needs when we monitor them, we move them up into the tertiary level, the third level of support. So our tier one is the high quality standards-based instruction for all kids, differentiated to meet their needs, screened on a periodic basis to identify when they're struggling and those kids that need additional support. Tier two are the students not making adequate progress in their core curriculum and they get intensive instruction matched to their needs. And then in tier three, again, those tier two students who are not making enough gains get additional intensive intervention. And that doesn't mean they're not still getting that universal instruction at tier one because they are. These are additional supports that are put in place. Another component of the RTI system is called collaboration. Collaboration meetings happen two to three times per year at minimum, and it's when a student's team meets to discuss the kids that have data that indicate that they are lagging skills. Um, the teams are similar to student assistance teams, which are in place in other districts. Um, they meet to discuss where the student is, and develop plans to address those skill deficits, identify who's going to be delivering the interventions and how often, and when we're going to check again to see if the student has started to make those gains that we're looking for. For literacy, our tier one components include the classroom instruction and reading, the Lucy Clackens writing curriculum, and then teacher-based interventions 
um, as they look at differentiation for students. So that could be uh, leveled groups for reading, that could be really working with kids on sound and letter ID, um, or sight word identification, or getting their fluency up to speed. For Tier 2, we have literacy supports in place. Sometimes these are funded through Title I, sometimes these are district positions, or sometimes they might be additional teacher-based interventions. Uh, they usually begin after a collaboration meeting based on data from screening, and they might include alternate curriculum approaches like SPIRE. At the Tier 3 level, we're looking at uh, if the student needs a special education referral. For math, our Tier 1 is classroom instruction and in our everyday math curricula curriculum, including differentiation at times. That differentiation could again be flexible grouping and additional practice and things like fact fluency or number ID, if those are the pieces that students need. At the Tier 2 level, we're looking at math support, and again, a lot of this happens through Title I funding, but it could be additional teacher-based interventions as well after a collaboration. Um, it could include additional curricular approaches like touchpoint math or Saxon math. And again, if a student has not made adequate progress through those Tier 2 supports, at the Tier 3 level, we look at if they need a referral. So behavior is the piece that's really been worked on since we met last year. Um, this is an area of RTI that's still in development. And what we found as we worked on it is that schools have different pieces in different places. And so we've pulled together a district group that's working to define our approach to behavioral RTI. One of the pieces is making sure that we include behavior, first of all, and that we look at the behavior problems as actual skill deficits that can be taught and addressed. So with behavioral RTI, one of the pieces that we needed to put in place was finding a universal screener. And so we have identified a tool, it's called the SRSS, or the SIBSS, and it looks at student behavior. It's a long acronym. Um, we have piloted it once on paper at Dyke Newell, and it's been shared with the administrative team and the district team that's working on the behavioral RTI. And so IT has been supporting getting that paper product into a more friendly technology-based platform that we can look at multi-levels of data analysis, so the classroom level, the grade level, the whole school level, and so we're looking to begin that um, web-based piece at Dyke Newell next year and having the other schools start with that paper-based um, component that my schools have tried out this year. We also gave a survey to K-5 teachers in RSE 1 to identify the top challenging behaviors so that we could address them through some Tier 1 interventions like guidance classroom lessons um, and classroom PBIS interventions. So our RTI for behavior, we're using our PBIS approach to really define those tiers. In Tier 1, each of our schools has a PBIS system in place, and so the district group is working to look at the necessary components that should be in place for effective Tier 1 behavior, and that's the work that's going to be happening in the coming school year. We're looking at if all schools have a matrix for expected behaviors in all areas across their school, if there are um, systems in place to recognize the positive behaviors, and what level we need to make sure that those are consistent across the district but still allow each school to have some of its own flavor and some of its own culture around that Tier 1 piece. Tier 2 is another place where we have a lot of different things going on. It varies from school to school, partly due to what the staff resources are and what their training is. Um, this is targeted for the next step after Tier 1. We're looking at including our guidance counselors, our social work support, as well as possibly behavior interventionists. That's a piece that I think the board heard about when we did our budget discussions this year. We looked at stressing the needs for interventionists in literacy and math, but also in behavior support as well. One example of a tier two intervention is called check in, check out. That's one of the highest um, recommended tier two interventions. Quick description of it is that if a student is struggling with a particular behavioral challenge, you address it, you teach it with them, you do a goal setting piece with them, and you set up a daily check-in and check-out. Could be multiple times a day, but at the very least, 
greeting them when they come in the door, establishing again what their plan and their goal for the day is around that expected behavior, and checking out with them before they leave and seeing how their day went. Um, this has been really a productive intervention with a lot of students across the state. It takes adults that they feel really comfortable with and they want to check in and check out with. Um, so the, the human resource piece of that can sometimes be a little difficult to figure out. The tier three interventions are we're looking at small group or individual pullout teaching using specialized curriculum. Some examples include superflex um, and zones of regulation, targeting school strategies and social skills. Again, this requires some specialized training, some interventionists who can pull students. The trick right now is that these um, Tier 3 interventions are typically offered by special education teachers, and so they're available for our special education students, but they're often needed by students who are not special ed. Um, another Tier 3 piece that comes into play is that we have positive behavior support plans, or PBSPs, for those identified students, and that's based on work by Jessica Minahan, and we'll be looking at that as we move forward as well. So needs and next steps. RTI needs in general. This is um, quite a bit to organize and quite a bit to oversee for teachers and for administrators. So a possible oversight and coordination position or person um, would be of benefit to moving this forward. Right now, the elementary administrators and Judy have been moving ahead with it um, and will continue to do so, of course. Tightening up of timelines for collaborations and progress monitoring. We have them mapped out roughly in that plan that we presented to you. Um, what we need to do is make sure that those collaborations are happening at a time that makes sense with the trimester system and the report cards and the parent-teacher conferences and the teaching that's going on. Systematic documentation of interventions. We've tried a couple different approaches with this. Um, we've tried a Google Doc and we've also been working with IT to see if we can use a tab on the infinite campus. Um, student information to document the RTI interventions and so we'll be moving ahead with that. We've also discussed if we need an additional progress monitoring system like AIMSWEP. Um, to kind of dig into that, we really need to look at what the benefits of that would be. We have some ideas about it, but we need some more information and we need to have some more discussion with staff around that. Specifically around literacy and math, our next steps will be doing some staff professional development right off the bat next year around our new literacy assessment, the benchmark assessment. And for needs, we're looking at instructional coaching and reflection on teaching practices. And then content area intervention is to support students who are not supported by Title I or special education but need more than classroom teacher interventions. And it's worth pointing out right here that not all of our schools are Title I schools, and so we really struggle looking at how to support kids who need Tier 2 interventions when there are not Title I staff available to do so. For behavior, our next steps, the district group will meet with the administrative team and develop approaches for Tier 1 PBIS at all schools, K-5. The school-based groups will tailor the PBIS programs to meet their cultural and community needs, some examples are the Woolwich Way, the Phipsburg Helm, the Falcon Pride, Doug Newell has bees, and we're kind of tailoring our PBIS program around being safe and being kind and being responsible. And identifying additional Tier 1 interventions, um, things that are in place across some of our schools include a focus on mindfulness, responsive classroom, um, and other classroom-based skills that teachers can use to motivate positive behaviors in students. For needs, Tier 2 and 3, intervention support for non-special education students who do have identified skill deficits. And we can take questions if you have any questions. Can I just add that um, the social workers slash guidance counselors, um, Devin Lease and um, Sarah Helton, Sarah Helen's been involved and Julia Skidmore, um, Sarah DeRosa, and Cameron Rennie. They 
and Nancy Riggs as well, we just put out a call and said, you know, we need to take the next step, and they very enthusiastically met that challenge, and they met for a full day in May, and they have done so much work in a short period of time. I really look forward to seeing what they will do to carry this out, because I think that we all recognize that as a need, but I really think that they deserve to have some acknowledgement in the work they've done. Okay, well thank you for your work. Any questions from the board? Oh, Steve has one. Why not? Um, so it seems to me you've got you've got at least four variations on a common theme, right, with each with each building. Uh, and, and what kind of a problem does that present? to the board, to the community, from a measurement perspective. But how do we, if you, if you allow that there are, you know, there are cultural differences and differences in community need, and, and you know, you provide the opportunity for, for flexibility on, on building level, where, where's, the common, where's the common measurement that we're going to be able to report back to the community that we've made, we've made progress. I think it's more of an opportunity for the schools to really take that PBIS approach and make it feel like their community's approach. So what we're looking at moving forward with and what is already in place in most areas is that each school has a PBIS matrix. So that lists all the different locations that students might find themselves in from cafeteria and playground to bathrooms and hallways and classrooms and defines under those schools rules what the expected behaviors are like in those areas. So what does being safe in the hallway look like? What does being kind in the hallway look like? What does being responsible in the hallway look like? And so we can do that at Dyke Newell that's really targeted to the pre-K through second grade kids with language that's appropriate for them, sometimes explained visually because they're not reading yet. And then we can do that in Woolwich with the middle level students and it's more targeted to their understanding and to their expected behaviors. So I think what the approach does is it gives us um, a really fluid product that we can apply to the students in a way that they're going to really grasp and understand. The measurable piece comes with that screener. So the screener would be the same across the district. And what that screener looks like is uh, one side has various characteristics of external behaviors that students might present that are problematic. And one side has internal behaviors that a student might present that are problematic, like anxiety and withdrawal and refusal to complete work. And the teachers are rating those students that they have in their classrooms with a pretty straightforward numerical kind of rating system. It's very subjective, but it's from the people that work with those students every day and know their behavior, and that gives each student a, a score, a periodic score throughout their years as they work with us. And those scores have certain cut marks that indicate when there is a potential problem. So the screener is, is consistent, but the way that we can present those behavior expectations to kids and ask them to respond to us can be the Woolwich way, or the, the Dyke Newell way, or the, the Phippsburg, or the Fisher Mitchell way. And isn't there sort of a level of commonality? I mean, you call it different things. So in a sense, those themes, there are common themes that run through all of those cultures. And I, I would think that it's giving you a head start, you know, because you guys have been conscious working with your students on this is, this is how we behave in the hallway. This is how we behave in the classroom. You call it something different, but you spent a lot of years, you know, some schools, many, many years, developing these cultures. And I think it would integrate really well with this behavioral RTI because you've already thought about it. Exactly. The PBIS part is not new. Um, every school has matrices already in place and has their own way of teaching those behavior expectations to kids. I think in a lot of schools it's time for a refresh. Like I know at my school, some people are not fully aware of the behavior matrix, the PBIS matrix, and so it's time that we kind of bring that back to the forefront and not just think that people know it and are doing it, but kind of make that a new focus again. Um, but PBIS is in place, and so the, the piece that can differentiate from school to school, again, is how we talk to students about it, the kinds of um, 
figureheads that we use to promote that behavior and also how we recognize that behavior. So Doug Mullen is student of the week and we have a big beehive that we're planning to use and we're going to earn some bees and, and do some positive recognition around good behavior. And um, Fisher has the, the pride, Falcon pride tickets, right? And you've got Helm Recess and um, Woolwich has the Woolwich Way. Any other questions for Jen? Staff. Just one more. I, you know, the difference between the tier three and, and an IEP and assessment for identifying someone, uh, one of the kids is tier three and tier three is IEP. Where, where's the line? Aside from the formality of, of the IEP process, are there other commonalities in terms of the way you, you assess the, the, the student? around behavior yeah i think that's where we really need to dig in quite a bit because tier two is i think being put together for students who need it um, reactively right now as opposed to really proactively we're kind of having to put tier two supports into place because we have students that need tier two interventions but we don't have a great system yet and we don't have um, necessarily a, a common understanding and a common skill set across our buildings with, with different staff. And then tier three beyond that, right now one of our only go-tos is to say, you know, whatever tier two interventions we can offer right now don't seem to be working, so do we need to look at special education? Um, I think we need to have perhaps those interventions in place so that we can address tier two and tier three needs without always moving to that that next step, which might be a special education referral. I'm not sure if my colleagues have anything to add for that. I think that when you see the Tier 2 system in place, you'll see a decrease in the number of referrals to special ed because children will respond to the interventions. So I think that it, when we're teaching these things, when we're teaching the expected behaviors, for example, since we're in the cafeteria, it, you know, it used to be a day when kids would come to school and you could say something like, use your manners, and everybody would sort of have the same common understanding of what that meant, but we are finding more and more over time that students come to us and that's a skill deficit. They don't know what that is, and so in their, in their house, standing up and walking around and eating might be okay, but in our cafeteria, that's not okay, so we start the beginning of the year and we have, left, our teachers have lessons plans, which is what Jen was referring to about how it would be different. Their lesson plans at Dyke Newell or Woolwich might be different from ours on Phipps Park, but we are all teaching that expected behavior of what's going to happen when you go to the cafeteria. And then, you know, you learn that and it's retaught, and then, you know, very few kids will make it to the level three intervention if we are able to have a solid tier two um, system in place as far as, you know, I spend a lot of time with students who have trouble on the playground and my check-in, check-out is running to the classroom before they go out and going over the little list of, okay, what are you going to do today to be safe and responsible and respectful? And then checking in when they come back in from the playground. And that, you know, that takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, and I might not necessarily be the student who the, the be the person, the adult that the student connects with, but it, it's, a, it's a lot of work to find in your building those people that kids do connect with. But it is done, and it's, it's done in every school, and we're just continuing to work on it and trying to make it better. Um, so that was a good question. Um, so, if, and here's especially two students who sort of worked in the process where um, within the classroom they had um, behavioral needs and they were put on check-in, check-out systems, they were given like a chart, a point system, targeted behaviors that we wanted them to obtain and you know, they worked through, they were working through those and about six or eight weeks later we would meet and review the data, like was the intervention working? And in both cases, um, while the, both kids are making progress, they weren't making as much progress as we would have liked. So um, we sort of put our heads together and came up with some more strategies. And one of those students sort of made it. And the other student, we ended up going to you know, tier three and going to the behavior program, sort of around the other student, you know, made the game that we, that we were hoping for. And now there's a solid plan going into, into next year. So, 
in addition to the, the, the screening, like each school has their way of tracking um, specific skills they want those kids to do, and they can monitor whether or not the intervention is working, and then if it's not, try a different one, and that doesn't work. You know, how far do we need to go before the kid can be successful or the child can be successful? So. <laughs> Okay. Any other? Steve, did you have another? You could? Jen? Um, I, I apologize if I don't know this, but um, on the academic side of RTI, not behavioral, um, for schools that don't have Title I support, how many, how many RTI literacy and math people do we have in our system in terms of, like, you know, let's say K9, K8, K9? Um, that are available to that second and third level? Uh, so that probably most directly affects us at Woolwich. Um, we currently don't qualify for any Title I services. Uh, so we have a K-4 literacy interventionist who is a um, salary position, just one of our staff. Um, that can provide literacy interventions to our to our K to four students, but is is stretched incredibly thin. Um, she has over 45 kids that she's working with in this past school year, uh, and then beyond that, um, creates a little bit of a gap in fifth grade. Um, she does what she can, but can't really pull kids to provide that intermediate support. So we really do, as you know from budget presentations over the last two years, without having the Title One support, we kind of get caught. You know, because we're missing that by a few percentage points, which means that we still have a significant number of kids that are at risk um, with literacy, specifically as the area we can provide support. Math is even less. Uh, we don't have anyone that's specifically designated as an interventionist for math at all. Um, so it comes down to tier one and then whatever the teacher can create as a tier two intervention, you know, a different instructional approach that would qualify as a tier two intervention, but Resource-wise, that's a staff, that's the classroom teacher, possibly um, a volunteer or someone who can help, you know, with some repetition, some kind of uh, activities like that. But you know, we do kind of get caught in that. Beyond that, as you ask, K to eight, um, our we're just very fortunate. We have an exceptional person in the K four literacy position right now who has done a lot of work with our staff upstairs to try to help make some, you know, close some gaps. Um, just in terms of how we consistently assess students, monitor their progress, but um, we really, truly at Woolwich have one person that's designated specifically as an interventionist outside of special education um, services. So. And I've been away from this for a while, but does Title I um, qualification bounce back to free and reduced hot lunch applications? It's, it's, percentage, it's percent, percentage of your student population is free and reduced lunch. So it goes back again to that area of if we could get the people who actually could qualify for that to apply to that program, regardless of using it or not, it brings in so much other money and it would allow this kind of support. But I, I feel that we put a lot of work into our behavioral. I mean, having a behavioral um, RTI program is amazing because it's, it's one of those things that maybe not be required by all of our other academic requirements, but we have it. And Really important. I think we put a lot of money and time and effort into that. I think that's wonderful, but I would really like to see that much money and time and resources be put into the RTI literacy, especially for the math and the anything in the might be a good board goal going forward in terms of funding and in terms of realizing that those needs continue there. Um, but again, I guess Tim it might go back to somebody in the food service area who could really maybe help our community understand the importance of applying for those free and reduced hot lunch programs that open up so many other resources for our schools, even if they personally choose to use them. Hopefully that's what we can do. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else from the board? Okay. Thank you, folks. Thanks Thank for coming you. in on a summer evening. We appreciate it. We will move on to uh, committee reports and perhaps we'll juggle things around here because I know there are some folks here from the communications committee. Um, we could move communications up.
So let's begin with uh, our communications committee report. We'll call that 8.1. Um, so uh, I want to thank the communications committee for coming tonight. Um, we have uh, most of them here tonight. This is Karen DeSilva, she's going to set up. And um, I think our mayor, you might be going with her. Ray Shelley Leonard is here, and Ash Carl, and Beth Schultz, and Jamie Dorr. So thank you all for being here. I think Erica Benson's the only one who's going to make it today, right? And of course, Dean, who's been an integral part of, uh, of the communications team as well. So they're going to give you a presentation about what we've been working on the last several months. I appreciate all their hard work and for coming out tonight. presenting to everybody, so I'll try to remember to turn. Um, I'm Karen Solo. Uh, I'm one of uh, the uh, communications committee. Uh, most, uh, just like uh, Lou had mentioned, almost all of us should go today. So uh, a lot of a lot of um, lunch times and early morning meetings to sort of bring to you some interesting information about the overview and and hopefully paint. Um, a picture of where we think we can see the communication going. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to um, cover six things here, the purpose of the committee, the RSU One story, the communication plan, the RSU One site content, and then engagement. Uh, first being the purpose of the committee, which we're going to cover the members, the goals, the methodology, and the SWAT. Uh, can we fix this? It seems like it's angle it just a little bit. So we're our first meeting, right? Um, we met Patrick and Lou, and they sat everybody down, and they told us this was the reason we were coming together. We were going to evaluate the current communication system for RSU, uh, what we use to connect with students, families, and the community. We also wanted to explore opportunities to improve the existing avenues that RSU won uh, utilizes in communication with the community, and we wanted to recommend some new communication channels uh, when necessary. Um, I'm not going to bore you with all of this, but I do want to tell you there are some very important people up here. <laughs> um, almost everybody has some form of 
uh, marketing or communication um, experience. And I think, as most of you know, Bath is really an interesting melting point uh, pot for people that really do come from different areas and, and different uh, experiences. Okay, so um, we talked about the purpose of the, the committee, but I do want to make a, a mo just take a moment to talk about the goals of the committee. So uh, it was about establishing an overall com uh, communication goal. I mean, we we all sort of came to this meeting to to a certain extent as frustrated parents from RSU one. You know, we were feeling. Uh, you know, as if we were involved in a system that didn't feel like it had one clear voice, it didn't feel like it had a strong community sense. And we know that that isn't the case when you look at what the Bath Greater Area and, and RSU1 really stands for. So in our communication goals, we really were about trying to understand where the issues are, how to sort of plot a course to really be successful in communication, and also to define the, um, the content, you know, trying to create a roadmap for content. Um, how did we do this? Well, we started with um, a survey to the principals and teachers. We wanted to know what their preferences were, what they felt worked for their schools. Um, we then split into two committees. I we split our group, our committee into two groups. One evaluated the current RSU one site, and the other um, evaluated all the current sites and communication for the six RSU one schools, as well as the vocation. We, we spent some time, and, and I know the principals left, but they all sat with us for. Poor Ross had to sit with me for like an hour and a half while we answered and he answered all the questions for me. So it was, it was really important that we connected with the schools. Uh, and then lastly, we created a document reflecting our recommendations, which is basically what we're looking at today. All right, so um, in, in looking at all the, um, the information that came in, we uh, organized our thoughts in a SWOT. Um, so as you look at our strengths, you know, Bath is, has such a strong sense of community. I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I cannot go into Shaw's without running into at least three people I know. I mean, it, it really is a rare community where no matter where you are, you, you are greeted by your neighbors. You are um, seen as like a piece of like this community. Uh, the schools have a rich history. I. The alumni parade is probably one of the few parades where there are more people on in the parade than watching the parade. I mean, it, it's really an amazing place. Um, the uh, the RSU One mobile app and site uh, that is some serious forward thinking to be able to create um, an app that allows you to get updates right on your phone and help you understand what's going on at the schools um, through our surveys. We you know, found out, which we, we suspected, that the administration is really open to change. I mean, they, they want to succeed. Um, and that there already is a strong communication between parents and stakeholders. Uh, when we look at our weaknesses, there is a lack of consistency regarding what info can be found and where, um, which, which can look, um, unfortunately, it can look really, um, uh, chaotic, you know, like there, that there's no order. Um, all the schools are uh, use different methods and platforms. You know, of course, there are a lot of things to choose from, and I think that it's just human nature to gravitate towards things that you like better than others. But it does really sort of um, affect the way some something looks as far as its unity, how it comes together. Um, there's a perceived lack of community support for students by students. Uh, the budget constraints, right? Budget's always a problem. Um, list, I mean, the limit in, uh, for investing in communications over things like staff and supplies and faculty. Uh, but then when we look at the opportunity, RSU One Schools as a hub for community activity would really help the committee come together. Um, it would better support the students. 
it would create a clear and consistent RSU1 message for all the schools uh, through one channel. It would make it easier for parents and community members to access the information they need when they need it. Um, it, re it would reinforce voter support for school budget in new high school, right? Because education is knowledge and we want to educate our, our community. Um, and for students to participate in the communication and media can, can really be a, a big point to moving forward. Um, then our, our threats, um, you know, people have different preferences, yeah, we kind of talked about that. Um, though we all suffer from an information overboard, we expect our uh, pertinent information to be handed to us. And absolutely, this is why it is so important to have all the right information in the right place. Um, one place. And the RSU1 school admin puts out a lot of different information, has different goals, and may have to adjust to a learning curve. Sure, they do, but I think, you know, guidance and um, a direction can really be valuable things in the right people's hands, and having uh, different schools with the same sort of roles, there's uh, a lot of overlap, and there are definitely ways to be more efficient and to compare notes. Um, there may also be some, some costs involved as well, so again, the budget. Um, overall though, what we, what we did find out was that the schools are more than willing to adapt to communication, and in fact, they have. They've adapted to every kind of communication that has been um, developed or evolved and put in front of them. The problem is that it's very difficult to uh, to communicate in all these different platforms well. So eventually there are uh, things that suffer, right? Uh, no one, you know, uh, I think uh, the tech guy, you know, he made a point that everybody's got a full day already. Like how are we gonna get these administrative people to, um, to create emails and printed newsletters and update our websites and also keep in touch with all the parents and make sure that they've got all the right information. It, it's very difficult. Um, and so what has happened, and it, and it happens everywhere, it's not a new idea, that things have, have grown organically, right? Or, organic is a great word. It should describe the food you buy for your kids or your lunch. It should not describe technology or like the decisions you make for technology or communication, right? You need a strong plan. A strong plan shows strength, shows um, a solid um, you know, uh, community, and it, it shows that, that you're owning something, that, you, that you, you know, you're leading something. Right, the RSU1 story. So in order to sort of move forward, we kind of want to look back a little, right? When we think of the Great Bath Area, it is synonymous with community, right? Um, our schools and our local youth really are the central center of our communication or our community. Um, there's a rich history here um, from School Union 47 to RSU1, the first region to come together under the state of Maine's um, solidation proposal. Our roots have always been in strong community ties. Uh, Morse High School is the oldest and the most active alumni association in the, neighbor, in the nation. Uh, we basically, for generations, brought families together through school here. So it's, it's a time to act. You know, Americans are becoming more detached from each other in their communities, especially our youth. We've seen a lot of reports and information coming through um, some, of the, some of the work that actually Jamie's been doing with her group. Um, you know, this is an opportunity not to only inform parents, but to knit the community together with the school as a hub for community activities. And so, as we look at a, a communication strategy for RSU1, we're not trying to reinvent anything. We're actually trying to go back to the core of Baths and RSU1's community roots. With a rich culture, strong identity, our communication strategy is about using today's technology to embrace our existing values. We strive for one strong voice for RSU1, and we do this by uh, creating a communication mandate. All right, the plan. 
here we go. Um, okay, so good communication is always about supporting an organization's mission and goals. So, just like we looked back at that, we look back at what RSU1 has done and where their mission is. It's to think, to act, to care, right? To support and challenge students to develop and apply the skills, knowledge, and character to be responsible and productive learners, citizens, and leaders in a global society. And in, in looking at that, we use that as a base to create a mission for our communication, right? RSU1's communication mission should be one strong voice. The RSU1's communication is about being consistent, transparent, and engaging. Our goal is to strengthen our communication to our community. Now, there, there are a lot of goals here, and we'd like to sort of uh, organize this in short, medium, and long. And obviously, this is a, um, this is a recommendation. You know, uh, in order to really implement it, there's a lot of people that need to get involved. There's a lot of budget talk to happen. But um, ultimately, we want to really think about how to get us to this place. Um, the position of the RSU1 website as the center of information, allowing for other channels to trickle out and support the website, is really the main idea. Um, we want to make the RSU1 site and school sites more intuitive, visually engaging, and user-friendly so that the people do feel comfortable going there. Um, we want to use the site to create a regular digital mobile friendly newsletter, email, or sort of a recap that pushes you out the information that we've been reporting on on the site. This isn't a, a, like, a like I said again, we're not reinventing the wheel, we're not scrapping anything. In fact, we're celebrating that we have a really good base in uh, technology. We just want to stand up and be strong about the direction and the process to creating the information, where it belongs, and how it sort of moves out. Um, We've worked, um, even though Dean wasn't a part of our um, um, bios for the uh, for the members, we did work very close with Dean um, about really understanding sort of the issues that they have with the website and what they've been trying to accomplish for the last uh, few years. Um, he's very aware of our priorities. You know, we would like to see a focus on the consistency of the information, the content, the, the way the navigation works in the web pages, how we can really sort of move forward to update profiles, landing pages, calendars. Um, Dean is actually already looking into news aggregator sites uh, and when they'll be ready. You know, and these are um, uh, processes that are actually a part of the system that we've already bought into. Um, because that's essentially what we're talking about with RSU1, that it becomes this aggregator of all information. Um, and so, you know, we are suggesting um, Q3 and 4 of this year. Um, Dean thinks that there are some changes he can make, but again, you know, there, there, are, uh, there are definitely some steps to sort of implementation here. Um, the medium term, which is actually very exciting, um, these ideas of once we have uh, the tools in place, how we can move forward. Uh, and, and we see it as sort of working with the school administration and teachers to create communication guidelines, right? Like to have the parameters so that people can excel at what they do, to, to know where their boundaries are, to, to know what's expected of them. Um, we also see an opportunity to involve the student body in the RSU1's content needs. And, you know, realistically, you know, mid-2018 is probably where we're going with that. Um, then long-term, um, the idea of communication 2.0 really is about two-way communication. And it becomes really important in engagement and, and involvement in the community. And to see, uh, possibly 2020, having this clear vision as we move into a new high school, as we have a, a community that really supports and knows, um, you know, is a part of, of, of the community as a whole, would really be sort of our long-term goal for communication. Um, let's see, why did I go backwards? There we go. Um, so I'm 
I'm good with time, right? Can I just go through some details? Yeah? Of, uh, okay. Um, so the RSU1 website becomes information central. We were talking about things that already do exist, but we need it to come from one place. Um, so it's the alerts, the announcements, um, we're talking about calendar uh, maintenance, we're talking about ideals that cross-pollinate between the schools and the district, um, we're talking about how you navigate through the menus. Um, if you've ever visited some of the schools within RSU1, you'll notice that it isn't quite as consistent as you would hope. Um, you know, we, we're also talking about creating landing pages for the grade, for the department, or teacher, and, and more detailed information. So again, not that it doesn't exist, but we're just trying to bring it together so it, it feels more consistent, cohesive. Uh, here's a, uh, an, an illustration of how that could possibly work. So, you know, in the middle you've got the RSU1 site, but you've also got the app announcements, the email announcements, the newsletters, the event calendar, the um, emergency alerts. Uh, technology exists to assist in distribution, so consistency is needed to, in how we send out information and how often information is pushed out to students and parents. I think that you know, uh, having straightforward guidelines for the administration and staff regarding communication content uh, is really crucial. Understanding uh, the, the methods and having guidelines for emergency announcements, guidelines for school messenger announcements, guidelines for infinite campus announcements, the newsletters, which tends to be about as inconsistent as you can imagine from one school to another. Some do quarterly, some do weekly, some do print, some do email. Um, even if they are progressive enough to send out an email, they're not mobile friendly, so if you're pinching or expanding, trying to see what it is on your phone, and then trying to open an attachment that is a part of that email, that doesn't move us forward, that doesn't uh, encourage our, our parents to, to keep track of what's going on, um, and, it, and it really needs to be all pulled together. Um, social media, just a note here that it, it needs to be reiterated to staff and the athletics um, co-curricular programs that social media exists to support the communication. It's never a primary means, which I, I think we've seen a lot of um, um, so the issues um, mostly from parents about Facebook. Um, it's not that social media won't be encouraged, it just needs to trickle out. And when you go to the website and you go to Morse and you go to the tennis club, then you should have a, list, uh, a link right there to Facebook if you, so that you, you're always constantly going to one place to find your information. Uh, again, looking at the main goals for phase one, it's about creating a cohesive plan, building the tools, and educating the administration and the teachers. And that the deliverables are, you know, continuing the review that we've been doing with the site and working with Dean's team, um, you creating a user's guide for administration and teachers, create a sort of recap um, digital newsletter that pushes information to parents and you know is mobile friendly and an app just like our, our app you can actually filter so that things really push to you that you're interested in depending on where your kid goes to school um, and then we we also need to resolve a bit of an interim solution to parents that need a printed newsletter all right content two more guys um, so this is interesting. I, I have to say my background is really in advertising and marketing and, and strategy. So it's not just about how we do things, it's why we do things and why it's important to, you know, where this is all coming from to really own what it is that we're trying to do. Um, so why is the UF, why is the RSU1 site so important? Well, it's essentially today it's our news paper. It's our spirit club. It's a reflection of our community. It's where we are writing our history and it's how we connect with our community. Um, and where is the information coming from? Well, it's the Department of Education, it's RSU1, the district, it's the schools, it's the classroom. 
And it's important to also outline the content. You know, creating a, 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 a strategy for content is really going to help the people that are already overworked do what they need to do for um, for communication. So we're looking at emergency notices and cancellations. We're looking at minutes and agendas. We're looking at school news, policy handbooks, and forms. You know, it's, it's a content policy and guidebook that needs to be created and put into the hands of people that, that we need um, doing this on a, on a regular basis. Yeah, and if we just pause for a minute here, there is actually a really big opportunity here. When you think of math, uh, when you think of math historically, um, it was really known for the grit and hard work that it, you know, for, for hundreds of years, building um, ships and, and all the industry that sort of followed suit on the river. Um, but it, it was also well known for its ingenuity and innovation. And um, as to, you know, it's time, unlike, the, you know, Bath is no different than the rest of the country and, the, and really the world, that it's time to really look at a new future for, uh, for our youth, for, you know, the, the students that are coming through the school. Uh, it's time to inspire a future of workforce, of our workforce. Um, Historically, right, a city of shipbuilders, today we want Bath to build ideas and content. And, you know, here's a, a really great opportunity to introduce an idea of creating a marketing club at Morse, something that can um, be managed by volunteering marketing professionals in the community. Um, the content would be produced by students. You know, it, we could see even a mentor program where the high schoolers were working with some of the elementary and middle school kids. We were talking about students that are interested in writing and photography and social media and graphic designers, uh, videography, technology. You know, this is something that is um, it's actually really dear to me. Um, you know. Again, I'm going to talk about Shaw's because I just went grocery shopping. But um, you know, if you walk by, if you drive by the the Rite Aid, you know, being built. I mean, it, there's a, a machine that's actually building the walls. It's it's really amazing. I mean, the future is not going to be a bunch of robots. That's not what automation is. You know, uh, are you know. Going to Target on a Saturday used to be a frightening experience. Now you can walk in and park right at the door. I mean, things are changing so quickly in our society, and marketing and, and telling, you know, a, a company or an organization's story, like bringing a human tone, you know, on a weekly basis to to customers, to an audience, to um, people that are part of the community is actually a a really, um, a, six, a really growing place in the marketplace. I think I was going to say. Um, okay, so last, last one, number seven, uh, number six. Sorry, this is about engagement. It's um, it's about change. It's about communication. It's about vision. Uh, a vision for communication. So why is good communication in you know important? It's it really is. It gives a human tone to RC1. You know, it makes a lot of people um, sort of connect emotionally to an organization or a brand when you have good communication. Uh, it's a way of telling uh, an evolving story for RC1. You know, it's, it's how to get people involved to pull them in. It's also how we engage with our community. But it, it actually can be even bigger. I mean, what we are talking about is communication, and there are ways to measure communication. You know, um, how do we how do we measure success of communication? Is it you know how do we, how do we decide or how do we uh, realize that RSU one schools have become the hub of um, com uh, the community activity? You know, is it an increase in attendance in school events, like um, football games? Um, is it more classroom volunteers? Is it um, bath businesses and organizations getting involved with schools? Is it a uh, student body, is it the student body feeling more connected to the community? You know, is it a higher attendance for school board meetings? 
I have to say this is my first one, and, but I, it has really inspired me to keep coming. Um, is it a unity? Uh, is it a uni uh, unified community for our new high school? And then lastly, the future of the Communications Committee. Um, you know, we've, we really want to thank the board for uh, giving us the opportunity to get involved in something as important as communication. And I think once we all realized the task at hand and, and what was necessary, and um, you know, I think that we realized that there was probably uh, an opportunity to keep moving forward. Uh, maybe not meeting quite so regularly, but having uh, a group to continue having these conversations, to work with technology um, for RSU1, and to potentially even really talk about how to set the guidebooks up and how to bring in student involvement. All right, that's it. I think perhaps a better, um, well, I would actually, I was on the, the group, with the group that looked at the RSU mm -hmm. communications plan, and we felt very strongly that the opportunity for the RSU is to, is to become a voice um, 
you know, a school-wide voice, not necessarily to, to take away the voices of any individual community. I think I thank you for your feedback on the presentation. I, I think what we were going for was that Morse really is a, is the melting pot for all of the communities. Unless kids or families choose to tuition elsewhere, everyone is going to end up at Morse at some point. I also I have two or had two students at Morse, so I was sort of funneling it through that filter. Um, I think it is important to respect that all the different towns and all the different schools have different identities. However, I have to point out that that's a little bit of the problem for communications because every school, certainly um, in the greater Bath area and within Bath, sort of has their own way of doing things. And what we're uh, hoping you'll receive is the feedback that it would be helpful for parents to have a place the RSU on website where they can access information that applies district wide. Sure, well, which will always send out its own newsletter, same for Bibsburg and around, you know, not around the state, but no, not so much. Um, but that's really the opportunity where we can step in um, as the RSU and create something that's beneficial to all families, regardless of where their address and zip codes. I just add to, I'm sorry, that was sort of my bad that I put bath on there a little too much, but I, um, I do think it isn't a weakness, it's actually a strength that like there's so many communities that, that do really sort of bring so much to the table. I mean, it, in, in fact, it's even a bigger argument to have such a strong presence you know, a, 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 an umbrella that covers this whole area, and then from the elementary on, you know, um, shows shows the support. You know, not just because I live in Bath and I'm interested in the Bath schools. I want to hear about what's going on in Woolwich or in uh, in uh, Phippsburg. Um, I, I think that there's. There's a real danger to a, a lack of information. You know, in today's world, when there's a lack of information, there are a lot of assumptions. And you know, the the, the fact is is that there are a lot of reasons uh, to come out and support the schools and the direct parents that are affected by that school do. But because we don't hear much about it, maybe a parent that is. Um, that isn't living in Bath, but knows that their kid will be eventually there for middle school or for uh, for high school, you might actually benefit from from seeing a bit more cross pollination across the board. Okay. Any other questions from the board, Steve? I just wanted to thank you for your thank you for your efforts. It was a great uh, presentation. So you can get a copy of it. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Chairman, this is a regular committee now of the board. Is that true? That's correct. We'll be meeting on going into the next It should be, yes. Because uh, I've got some ideas, but then you've done enough for tonight. <laughs> No, they were very willing to, I asked everyone if they were willing to, this is the kind of thing the board was interested in, that we would figure out how to be going into the next school year. So, uh, I do think that, yeah, I think, I think what the board needs to do is um, look at the directive that was given to the committee, what was it that was supposed to come out of that, have the committee summarize um, the recommendations, there seems to be a focus on the websites that I took from that, and sort of trying to create something that's universal, and then working with Dean and the building administrators and talk about, you know, does that work for them? Could they implement it? You know, who's maintaining the websites in the schools? Um, and get a sense from them if we can implement the, you know, eight or ten recommendations that are coming out of the committee, and then the board would, would move on it and, and perhaps even, as you suggested, make a policy. So I think that was a great presentation. You guys have some really dynamic people working on the committee, and you know we look forward to hearing updates in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank okay. you. Um, we will now, we've got three other committee reports. So let's go to Judy with uh, proficiency-based learning update. You want to do it right from here? Yes. Okay, great. Because I have none. <laughs> oh. Um, since we last, since I last reported to the board, people have just been focused on uh, the end of school and grades and 
all of that kind of stuff, so none of the leadership team have met. And that's it. Any questions for Judy? Okay, I'm going to give you a quick update on um, the Seguro Exchange Program. I just want to reach out and thank those administrators who are willing to attend um, either the dinner on the 29th or the lunch in on the 30th. I think we're working towards uh, reintegrating that program into the schools and just want to thank those of you guys who are able to attend. And uh, over the course of the summer, after the adult group shows up, we have the student group and then our students going, or vice versa, our students going and their students coming. So uh, hopefully somebody from the group can give an update as to how those um, exchanges went. But again, thank you for participating in the adult delegation dinner and luncheon. Uh, Morris High School building project update. I was not able to make the last meeting. I don't know if Alan or Steve, I know Alan, you went to the Hamden trip. Would you like to give uh, an update on that committee? I think we're doing well on progress. Uh, still trying to nail down the local portion. Seems to be the biggest challenge of getting the figures necessary to say yes. You know, what, in theory, it sounds great. But what we need to do to present to the people is, not only is it good, but it's going to be better overall, and it's going to be, in the long run, more efficient and less costly. So we expect, I think maybe this week, if not, in two weeks from now, when we meet again, I think we will have some fairly good figures uh, we went to Hampton Academy last Thursday. Uh, they have a geothermal system. It works very effective. It felt great in the building. The building is five years old. And I was impressed with the condition of the interior. It looked like they would already done all of their summer maintenance. It was spotless. And that, that's the impression I came away from it. If we can come anywhere as near that, we should be in good shape. As far as the plans are concerned, uh, we're hoping that we'll have some material for the Heritage Days things uh, this weekend so that people can see progress that is being made on it. Oh, some displays. Display type things. Great. But the interior is pretty well set. So the interior design is not, and as the architect said, you know, even after the thing is passed, there'll probably be some fine tuning right up to the time they get the building built. Okay, any questions for Alan? Steve, was there anything you wanted to add? No, um, no I think. I think there was a meeting this week, though. There is a meeting. Yeah, I think Thursday, 10 o'clock. Thursday. Okay, good. Text. Very good. On to uh, superintendent's report or assistant superintendent's report. Judy? Yes. Uh, Kathy Hendrickson, who is a first grade teacher at Dyke Newell, was honored by UNAM. Uh, as a, uh, one of their 2017 Teachers Hall of Fame members. Um, they choose nine teachers a year, apparently. They call them the UNAM Starting Nine, and they're honored before Sea Dogs game, which happened on uh, the 23rd of this month. So congratulations to Kathy on that. Um, as several of us can attest, graduation went very smoothly. It was a very hot day, but, uh, but it really, I, I've been to many, many graduations across many districts, and I'm always struck at how the Morris graduation is so student-centered. The speeches were wonderful. Um, John Stanton was honored, uh, and it, it went very smoothly. It was 90 minutes. 
and done. Uh, the last teacher day, um, we had lunch at Woolwich School, which we've done for the last couple of years. Uh, the highlight of the, the uh, event, I think, was not only honoring the retirees, but also we had a student speaker this year, which was new, uh, Graydon Peterson came and shared with us his um, his sort of journey through his schooling and the challenges that he has um, overcome all to uh, the benefit of Graydon from his teachers and he really celebrated teachers which, which was uh, a very nice way to end the year. All right, thank you. Uh, on to item 9.2, Deborah, financial report. Um, tonight's financial. There we go. Tonight's financial report is for the month of May, and as of the end of May, we have spent twenty-two and a half million dollars out of our twenty-eight million which is 80%. Um, and as you will see on your report, it has an encumbered amount of $4.3 million. And uh, the month of June will pretty much use most of that amount because in June, I will post seven payrolls to uh, the month of June because it covers all the way through. It will approve for all the way through for July and August. As far as our revenue coming through, we're at almost 90%. So everything that we had planned on, um, we are bringing in, and, and I think that we will meet the goal of, of everything there. Um, I would like to utilize, there is a law in the state for five, that allows for a 5% transfer between um, cost centers, and um, we would like to utilize that law and transfer $100,000 from the balance of regular instruction into the food service account to help um, eliminate that deficit that we're running at this point in time. Another thing that I would like to um, do is we have an undesignated fund balance that came from um, a May State Retirement trust fund that was at the state that they um, sent to each individual community to help and we've been using it to help pay the employer share for it's all for the participating district retirement which is a handful of ed techs mostly ed techs there's a, there's a few others but um, and this year alone we've spent $26,000, but next year I had budgeted an additional amount in those accounts, so we have a balance um, of about $200,000, and I would like to transfer that into the Moss High School project to give us a little bit better cash flow to pay um, the architects. And once that money comes through and we actually bond the project out after it's been approved, then it would all be paid back. And then maybe at that point in time, we'd transfer it into food service. So those are just two um, things that we, and I've spoke to our auditor about it, and that's something that we definitely are allowed to, to do. Do you need board approval for that? I don't. No, but it wouldn't hurt if you all said yay or nay. <laughs> just in case I do need it. I mean, I couldn't find that part of the law. It just said that we're allowed to transfer up to the 5%, um, but it wouldn't hurt if you gave your approval or asked questions about it. Does anyone have any questions or want to make a motion? Steve? Uh, just on the food service uh, piece, so you, you want to transfer 100000 out of the current year budget for food service? Yes. I'm talking about the regular instruction, the transfer from regular instruction to food service. Right, and regular yes. instruction is our la largest um, yeah. Cost no, center. No, yeah, I'm not questioning the source, but... Uh, but, yes. So basically what it will do is when you look at this financial report at the end of June, it will show that other food service category is a negative $100,000, but that's coming from regular instruction. But that will help 
towards that. What what is in the in the in the 1718 budget that we just voters just approved? There's another 250,000 right going for food service. So what what's the what well? I just ran uh, a report today, basically, and I have one more payroll that's going to hit June, and we have. Um, the June subsidy that will come through, and based upon that, at the, I mean, if everything was audited at, right now, at the end of June, we'd have a negative balance of 385,000 in the school lunch program. So it's my hope that um, by adding this 100,000 from the general fund, increasing the amount that we put in the general fund next year, that we'll start closing that gap, and hopefully it will be closed probably well, probably in a, probably in a year or two and once we get money funds back from um, the Moss project then we but this, could this close gap that this gap. gap is larger than the gap that you presented to the board or presented to the finance committee at least. Uh, I think it's pretty much right on target of what we were thinking because we were thinking a hundred thousand for this year's budget and 240, and that gave us the 340. It's a, I mean, it's a little bit different, but not a whole lot. I mean, because at that finance committee meeting, I think we were, everybody was understood that this isn't totally going to zero out that deficit yet in that first year. Yeah, I don't recall that. Excuse me, Deb, but I, Mr. Chairman, I think we need a motion to, to move on. It's 8 o'clock. Thank you. So moved. Okay, uh, motion by Bill to continue the meeting past 8 o'clock. Is there second. a second? Second by Allen. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Okay. Sorry, Bill. We'll continue past 8. Steve, did you have further questions about that? I think that answers the question. I don't recall. Uh, I don't recall the three. The, the size of, of the deficit being beyond the 240 that we, that we committed, you know, plus what we would, would commit normally to retire the deficit. But well, if, if you, if you, you stop and think of the 385, if we put 100 towards it, it's going to be 285. So maybe that is where, you know, you're thinking. And then next year we put in 240, so that and then as long as we, you know, it depends on what we lose next year as we move along. Okay. Did, did we talk about that at that, that, that meeting? I'm sorry, did we talk about that 100,000 at that meeting? You knew that you were going to be able to do that at that meeting? I thought at the, that yeah. time that yes. So I think just a I mean, I get, you know, it makes sense to eliminate the deficit. It gives, uh, gives every food service coordinator uh, Slope to start, but I, I still have reservations. It is, it is, as far from a financial management standpoint, I still don't completely buy into the fact that we need to get rid of this deficit in one year. Um, I agree to the two. I agree to the two forty. I think the way that conversation ramped up, I mean, I, I both of me need to commit less than, than, than the two forty, but. You know, I, I just hope we're not we're not draining our reserve. The opportunity to transfer this this money could be put into either a capital reserve or an operating reserve, as well as applied to the deficit, uh, to the food service deficit. But, you know, I'll, I'll I'll support the recommendation. But I just don't. Well, if we didn't have sure. a deficit, we wouldn't be transferring it over. So I mean, I think that we're just trying to close that gap um, and if we don't need it we wouldn't we wouldn't have to transfer that much over any further discussion from the board Ken I don't know about this part of statute but if we didn't have the deficit and we have this hundred thousand dollars in regular instruction regular instruction. Could we use that for regular instruction? Could we go and 
I guess I'm just surprised. Could we go and hire an extra person with that $1,000? That's that this year. That's the end of like right now. Right. We have that going forward. So for next no, year. We can't, we can't. We can't. That would go towards our big fund balance. I mean, it goes towards what we use to reduce the um, taxes to the, the, the towns, but we can't go hire somebody new now using that money. Or we'll hire someone next year we'll hire and, use them next that, year. and use that extra fund to, to make that a balanced budget neutral thing. That's not. No, because the voters have to approve line by line exactly what you're spending on, and they do allow you to do that 5% transfer if you need to. Could we take somebody who's part-time and make them full-time? Because I know we did that with the superintendent. We made that, the assistant superintendent we made that person full-time by moving some money around. Like, would we have some instructional support out there that was part-time and make them full-time? <coughs> no, because it's in the next year. Okay. This is all for the 16-17. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we have, and that, and the debt is in that same year. Right. Okay. Sorry. All right. So Deborah, if we do that, what will be the carryover from this year to next year? Our fund balance. It would. It would be. A, well, our fund balance wouldn't change on next year's budget at all. We used four hundred and fifty thousand in, in the next year's budget. Now, when we use that dollar amount, that's not every single cent that we have. Right. Um, so it would reduce. I mean, usually we have three or four hundred thousand dollar balance every year on the expense side. So we'll have probably two. I mean, I don't know by the time you know, because it's a it's a moving target all the time. Right. The invoices coming through and payroll. Um, until everything is done and over with, you know, I can't tell you exactly what the balance is. Okay. Um, any other questions? Do you want to make a motion? Do you want to wait for more information? What, what is the time? Well, my year ends on uh, June 30th. So, I mean, if you don't transfer the 100000 then we'll just continue forward with that with that negative balance in food service. And, that, and it goes into fund balance. The 100000 would go into the fund balance. Food service is a separate fund, so that 100000 basically is it's a, just a journal entry on my part that I'm going to debit the general fund and I'm going to put it into the food service special fund, which is a which is a different fund. I guess the point is this is our one opportunity before the end of the year we have to encumber this this money so if if you want to transfer it we have to do it now. Mr Chairman I would move that we make approval of the changes that you recommended. To case of pay now or pay later. We know we've got some big bills coming up later. We may need to transfer that some, if there is some next year left over, to something else, and then we're stoking the hole. Okay, so there's a motion by Alan to go ahead with the recommended transfer. I'll second that motion. Do them both together, right? Yes. Okay. Second by Bill. Any further discussion? I'm just going to abstain because of the comments of my association with the food service program. So for, I'm not going to vote on this. We've taken steps to solve the problem of the food service deficit anyway. We've taken a giant step forward. Yeah, we yeah. have. So, By increasing the budget. So. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Any opposed? None opposed? That passes. Anything else, Deborah? I don't think so. All right. Good luck at your end. On to old business, uh, specifically with board goals. Is there anything in here that anybody wanted to address or uh, 
tackle? Anything specific? No? I think we did a good job with the goals. I just want to point out that we did not hit that target of uh, referendum uh, on the high school for June. We're looking at now September or November. Um, but I think we were wise based on approval of these local items, some design issues and site issues. Uh, that's unfortunately, uh, you know, that's it. I think it was the most prudent, prudent way to go. So. Okay, on to policy, item 10.2, second reading of policy JLCB, immunization requirements for students entering RSU 1 schools. Is there a motion on this policy? Move to approve by Steve. Second. Uh, second by Bill. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. That one passes. Uh, item 10.2, second reading of policy, uh, excuse me, uh, 10.3, second reading of policy IKF, graduation requirements, class of 2017 to 2020. This is the easy one. All those in favor, uh, excuse me, is there a motion? Regarding the policy. Move, move approve, sir. Move to approve my bill. I a second. I got a second from Steve. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, that passes unanimously. Then on to uh, item 10.4, second reading of policy IKF graduation requirements. This is for classes of 2021 through 2025 and beyond. Is there a motion regarding this policy? Move to approve by Steve. Second. Second by Bill. Any further discussion on this? I just again, for the audience, for parents, and in reference to the communications committee, I do want to point out that in this policy, as we make these changes as a district, part A says communicating graduation requirements um, to ensure that every student and family has the information and resources they need to appropriately plan sequence the students' educational decisions, our schools, educators, and staff will clearly and consistently communicate the graduation standards and diploma requirements that must be met to earn a high school diploma. So for parents or folks that are concerned about this, that piece is part of this policy that those, as we implement those requirements, they need to be communicated to parents. Any other comments? All those in favor of the motion to approve? None opposed? That passes unanimously. Item 11.0, uh, new business. Personnel items? Any reports there? Okay, uh, we do have some resignations. Judy? Yes, uh, Lydia Crafts, social worker at Fisher Mitchell, and Marie Larson is a special ed teacher at Morse. I right, thank those folks for their service to the district. Uh, we will move on to, we have a couple of nominations. Um, everybody fine with taking these together? So we have nominations of John Wilson, science teacher at Morse High School, and Kevin Prager, uh, behavioral support teacher at BMS. Is there anything, Judy, that you wanted to add to those? No. Okay, you've got the backup, everyone. Um, would somebody like to make a motion regarding those nominations? Move approval, Mr. Chairman. Okay, move to approve by Bill. 
and second by Steve. Any further discussion? All those in favor of those nominations, raise your hand. Any opposed? None opposed? So welcome to the district. Okay. Uh, can I skip 11.3 leave of absence request? Dragged you out this long. Elliot's dying at home. I'm just going to say that because I can because it's my last meeting. All right. 11.3, leave of absence request. This is an action item. Judy, I'll turn this over to you. And I'm going to ask Paige to come to the mic and just explain to the group uh, why this is happening. So I'm requesting a leave of absence. Can you just, for because we're on TV, I know who you are, but can you introduce yourself? <laughs> sure. Uh, Paige Gallagher, I'm a 7th and 8th grade math teacher at Bath Middle School. Um, I'm requesting a leave of absence as I learned recently that my um, visa status to work in the U.S. is, um, I was not approved for this year because I finished my student um, work visa. So I made the decision to return to graduate school to study my master's of, in educational leadership. And I will be working with, um, still hopefully working in the district just through observing my other uh, educators and things like that um, to learn about the leadership role and then my hope is that in a year I will be able to return back to my role as a math teacher for a few more years and when I return as once I graduate with my master's degree I'll be granted more um, visa uh, work for work uh, visas to work with any questions for Paige Judy, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Well, we're all in mourning. <laughs> um, Paige has been a really key uh, member of our teaching staff at uh, Bath Middle, and we're definitely going to miss her, but I'm really happy that she's going to get her leadership uh, masters, and uh, we'll hopefully welcome her back soon. Any questions from the board? Okay, this is an action item, so uh, I need a motion. My motion that we approve the leave of absence. Okay, Lou has motion to approve. Uh, second by Steve. Any further discussion? She has to come back. <laughs> you must come back. Yeah, it's the contingency. All right, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. None opposed? Leave of absence granted. Enjoy your summer. <laughs> Item 11.4, we have a contract to approve. This is uh, probably our third or fourth year with this. This is the Great Schools Partnership Contract. They assist us with the proficiency-based learning. Um, their work has been primarily with, uh, or has it been only with Morse, or have they done work with BMS as well? Yes, both uh, as of last year. Both groups and probably more middle level um, next year. Not only BMS, but uh, well, which middle as well. Is there a motion regarding this contract? Move to approve by Steve. Is there a second? Second by Alan. Discussion? Just, just to uh, get the terminology right, this is the third year of this contract. And, and I think this might be the fourth year. Okay. And it, we're still supported by a state grant. We are. Any other questions, comments? Discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to approve the contract, raise your hand. Any opposed? None opposed, that passes. 
All right, item 11.5, uh, we need to approve property and casualty insurance bid. This is a bid from a new insurance provider. Uh, we're switching from, I don't know, from home to cross insurance. Um, I think this was a... From Maine Municipal. From Maine Municipal, thank you. Um, would somebody like to make a motion regarding Move to approve by Steve. Uh, second by Bill. All those in favor of the motion? Any discussion? I'm sorry. No? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Okay. Passes unanimously. Uh, then we have our, uh, to approve the computation and declaration of votes of the June 13th budget referendum. Those were the numbers that I referenced in my opening remarks. Um, is there a motion to approve these? Do we need to read Vita the declaration? I don't have a written motion, but if you, Steve, if you want to make a motion and then just read that that last paragraph. Um, I move we accept the computation and declaration of the votes. Oh yes. Uh, the RSU RSU one board of directors hereby declares that there were more votes cast in the affirmative than in the negative on said article, and finds that said article has passed. We have a motion. We have a second. Okay. Second by Lou. Any discussion? Alan? No discussion. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Okay. Any opposed? None opposed? That motion passes. We do. Thank you, Bill. We should hang around to sign that. Uh, public comment? Okay. Uh, next, meeting dates and locations. Typically, we do not have a July board meeting, but Steve and I talked about the prospect of having uh, a short board meeting. Do you want to speak to that? I suggest we set we set a date. The, the recommendation is that we uh, we set a date to meet uh, in open session and move to executive session to uh, talk about issues related to negotiations. Um, availability of, of the board is, you know I mean July is not a good a good month necessarily, but my my suggestion is that we set a date. People go back, check their calendars, and, and if we can uh, work with that date, then, then we do so. Does anybody have a date in July um, that would work for you or not work for you? I mean, we could begin with Mondays, because we typically meet on Mondays. 24th, 31st, 24th, okay. So let's tentatively plan it for July 24th at uh, Central Office. I don't say noon time, no, just kidding. Uh, time? Does anyone have a preference for time? Six o'clock, is that good? Okay, 6 p.m. Add that to your calendar and then we'll get back to Vita to confirm it. Uh, next regular scheduled board meeting is Monday, August 28th. Uh, location to be determined. Okay, and I just, again, I just want to uh, indulge myself, take a moment. This will be my last board meeting other than if we do the July one. Um, I want to thank you guys. 
Um, I just want to say that uh, you know when I was nominated to be on the on the Arousic school board, whatever, 11, 12 years ago, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but I do want to say uh, a lot of my connections in this community are tied to my kids. Um, the, the people that I'm friends with are a result of my connections to the school and really being on this board um, has kind of defined me and enhanced my life in a really positive way and I want to thank the district for that. Um, I think I'm a better person because of it and I know I'm much more uh, in tune with the community. So it's been a pleasure serving with you and it's been a pleasure serving the district and I look forward to working for the district. So thank you. So, so now you have to indulge us. So, um, this, this is, this is uh, your last meeting. I think it's been your longest meeting. <laughs> So uh, maybe it was losing your grip on it. I know, Sam. Um, Vita, I, I asked Vita how many uh, years you had served on the ARC board, and I think she said uh, you were elected in uh, 2008. You came on the board in 2009. So you've been on the board a great deal of time. You've committed a lot of time. Uh, you've made an enormous impact on education in, in the RSU. I think. Uh, uh, not only speak only for myself, I'm, I'm grateful to that and, and for your mentorship, uh, but I think the community is, is also very grateful for uh, your, your commitment to, to the schools and, and uh, uh, you've shown that in the amount of time and, and your willingness to serve but in the amount of time you've dedicated uh, to that. So, and when you have a card, Thank you, and I'll let other board members speak if they'd like to. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, we have talked before, but thank you for everything. You really, uh, you know, with great leadership, and uh, I'm glad you're still going to be in the district, <laughs> so that's good. But um, thank you for everything. Jim, it's most appropriate that we had a lengthy presentation on communication tonight. Because quite honestly, the integrity with which you have communicated with all of us and the community has been, I think, your strongest point. And I thank you for your service here, but also for your integrity and that communication because it was always there and it made the job a lot easier. Uh, and I think our schools are better for it. Thank you. I think you've seen us through an awful lot as an educational uh, identity, you know, from our first consolidation, from all the things that happened, from all the people that have come and gone, and um, you've been a steady force. You've given a tremendous amount personally and professionally to us. Um, and I don't thank you, doesn't seem to be enough, but I hope that it, it does come from the entire community. You've got such tremendous respect from the teaching staff and community members, and it's been a pleasure to serve with you. And um, all I can say is we'll do our best. I can echo most of the same things. I certainly am looking forward to you carrying over your communications and your leadership. <laughs> I will be watching them, no question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to make a request, Mr. Chairman, in your last meeting. I note that the August meeting is scheduled for August 28th, and I would like the site to be to, to be determined. I'll be in Dublin, Ireland that night, so if you all would uh, schedule the meeting for Dublin, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let Patrick work on that. <laughs> we'll have to get back and transfer some of that money to him. <laughs> Okay, well thank you so much. Um, I will now take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn, Move to adjourn by Steve. Second. Second by Bill. All those in favor of the motion to adjourn, raise your hand. Alright, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.